let's start at the beginning four basic tenets to get us started. And let me be clear, some of what you hear about the drive is going to be familiar to you. A lot of what you hear is probably not going to be familiar to you. But let's try. Let's see where we're at. First, to be human is to be an organism and a subject. Two, to be an organism and a subject, what Lacan refers to as a living subject, is to be sexed. Three, to be sexed is to experience a certain part of one's living, embodied, organismic being as lost. It's by way of the drives that we deal with certain other objects, all stand-ins for more primitive objects like the breast, feces, the gaze, the voice, in such a way as to recover from them, to restore to ourselves this earliest loss. This is the wager of the drive theory that we're gonna be working with here, that it's by way of the drives that we recover and restore this earliest loss. And I wanna emphasize earliest loss. It ain't me, by the way. That's a quote straight from seminar 11. What is this loss of life that the organism sustains when it is taken up in the dialectic of the subject as a sexed being? What's lost, I'd suggest, is the fact that at root, there's nothing in organismic life as such that represents the subject in and as the bipolarities of sex. This bipolarity of sex exists only at the level of the norms and orders of sexed social life. You can find this in 11. You can find this in a Cree. God didn't make us male and female. We did. To recover and restore this fact of life, apart from or at least unbeholden to the facts of life, is what it means to live out the drive. Understanding what we're after here, what all this amounts to, what this earliest loss is, is gonna be our first move in today's session. Right out of the gates, I'm gonna assign a name to it, libido. Libido is the word for an immortal, irrepressible, undivided, indestructible form of pure life. I'll show you the passages where I'm getting this from in a minute. The drive is a montage, a mashup, surrealist and otherwise, of openings, emergences, and returns by which we reclaim and restore libido. And enjoyment, jouissance, is how this feels. When we experience libido at the level of the drive, the word for that experience is jouissance. And we're going to clarify some different types of jouissance here. This is not the typical transgressive jouissance that always remains pegged to because just outside of the law, desire. This is a different kind of enjoyment we're talking about here, baby. All drives are sexual. Not because they represent the sexed polarity between masculine and feminine, male and female, or in the Freudian sense, active, passive, but instead because they are our points of entry, our ways into what Lacan calls, and I quote, 
the relation between the living subject and that which he loses by having to pass for his reproduction through the sexual cycle. It's a passage we're going to return to in a moment. What does this mean for analysis? And how might it bring us to this beyond of analysis that Lacan speaks of at the end of seminar 11? A beyond that according to Lacan has never been approached. To answer these questions is to bring us to the end of seminar 11, which is what we were reading and what we're commenting on today. But in order to reach these answers, we've got to take a few steps back. Moving backwards, I would suggest through a few key passages at the end of seminar 11 in the book's second part. To start, page 257. If you've got the text in front of you, pull it up. No sweat if you don't. We're working today, given the number of languages on the call here with us with the standard English translation by Sheridan of seminar 11. Page 257 is where we'll start. On 257, I'm at the bottom of the page. There's this bit about signifiers, sex, and death. I believe that this is one of the secret codes to unlocking what's happening in Seminar 11. And by extension, what's happening with the drive. Something is happening at the level of signifiers, sex, and death that allows us to understand what Lacan here is doing with the drive. The middle of the page of 257, <clears throat> he starts by talking about this privileged object. You can guess what it is. A privileged object known as object little a. We'll talk about that, don't worry. You're gonna get some clean definitions of that one as well. This object supports that which in the drive is defined and specified by the fact that the coming into play of the signifier in the life of man enables him to bring out the meaning of sex. Namely, that for man, because he knows the signifiers, sex and its significations are always capable of making presence the presence of death. Now, it's not the only reason why sex cues up death. And I would suggest that although it's a very Lacanian reason, because we have signifiers in play and signifiers always bring us up against death. Why? Because when you have a word for something, you don't need the thing as much. And by that, I mean lowercase t, the entity, the referent. I can talk about burritos. I'm in San Francisco. I talk about burritos all day long. I can talk about burritos without having one in this room. I can talk about my parent without having them in this room. When you have a signifier, the thing, the referent, it can die, it can go away, it can be absent. That's the classic Lacanian turn here. There's something else though, some other reason why sex is tinged with death. And that's what we're gonna try and scare out. Reading on. The distinction between the life drive and the death drive is true in as much as it manifests two aspects of the drive. But this is so only on condition that one sees, get ready, all the sexual drives as articulated at the level of significations in the unconscious. In as much as what they bring out is death. Death as signifier and nothing but signifier. Still middle of the road Lacan. For, how, for can it be said that there is a being for death? Some of you are in philosophy departments. I'll let you all sort that one out. Here's our question. In what conditions, in what determinism can death, the signifier, 
spring fully armed into treatment? Key question. This can be understood only by our way of articulating the relations. Our first step back from the end of seminar 11 is here on 257. Our next step back is on page 204 to 205, where you will get explanations for what's happening here on page 257. It's funny reading Lacan. Um, what you know about the graph of desire and where it starts is in a basic Lacanian understanding of language, speech unfolds diachronically in time, one event after the other, one word after the other, the same way a melody unfolds in music. You don't have the melody all at once. It would just sound like this, that's not it. Melodies unfold one note at a time. So also does speech. It unfolds diachronically in time, chronological time even, but it works chirotically for those of you that read Greek, I'm thinking of kairos here, the event, by a retroactive connection between the end of a sentence and its beginning. Bruce Fink has a good example of this about Jack and Jill. You know, Jack and Jill, who at a very young age were exposed to, you don't know shit about Jack and Jill until you know the end of that sentence. It's when you find out that they were exposed to their uncle Leonard in all of his partial objects that you can understand something about Jack and Jill. There's a retroactive arrow that moves backwards in time. This is not just important for understanding Lacan's theory of language and speech. And speech for him, don't forget, is the centerpiece of psychoanalysis. It is the object of study. But it's also important for remembering when you read Lacan, it's not enough to simply read him one page after the other. Some of you have had very frustrating experiences with that. The trick to reading Lacan is also being able to read his books backwards. And that's what we're doing here. I'm trying to work out what Lacan is saying, but also at the same time to show you at least what works for me when I read Lacan. And oftentimes I get to the end and I need to work my way backwards to figure out what's going on. 257, I didn't find that extremely helpful. 204 and 205, however, lit. We're on page 204. The topic of sexuality comes up again. And what we're going to do here is you're going to see Lacan pulling sexuality into two different directions. One which is going to be very familiar to you all. And another which if you were anything like me, is a little startling. Both are at work on page 257. Here on 204 and 205, you can see them in more crystallized separate form. Bottom of page 204. Sexuality is established in the field of the subject by a way that is that of lack. Fair enough. Putting it out to you all, who's got a mic on and the book in front of them and wants to read starting with two lacks overlap here? Just go ahead and jump into it if you've got your mic on and your book in front of you. That's right. I'm asking. Two lacks overlap here. Uh, okay, cool. Two lacks overlap here. The first emerges from the central defect around which the dialectic of the advent of the subject. To his own being in relation to the other terms by the fact that the subject depends on the signifier and that the signifier is first of all in the field of the other. Okay, pause right there. All right, that's the stone cold Lacanian stuff. Signifiers, big others, we get on the field of desire right here. This is fabulous stuff. What's new is what's about to come next. Please continue reading and thanks for letting me jump in. This lack takes up the other lack, which is the real earlier lack to be uh, situated at the, I'm sorry, situated at the advent of the living being. That is to say at the sex reproduction. 
the real lack is what the living being loses, that part of himself, K, living being, in reproducing himself through the way of sex. This lack is real because it relates to something real, namely that the living being, by being the subject to sex, has fallen under the blow of individual death. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. So let's see what's going on here. Let's first be clear about what's happening with the real. What Lacan is referring to here is an experience of life that is pure, undivided, eternal, indestructible. We're going to talk about what that is, and we're going to define that further. For now, I just want to put a pin in the word real. It's not the real. Before the symbolic, there was not the real. It wasn't like you were in this real bio-animalistic world, and then suddenly the symbolic shows up and squashes all that primitive, Edenic, blissful shit. That ain't how it works. The real is an effect structure of the symbolic. It's an effect of the symbolic. Whatever the symbolic can't metabolize goes into this category known as the real. The real comes second. It wasn't there first. The question Lacan is trying to get at here is what was there first, in a sense. The best clue we have for how he understands this pre-symbolic experience comes in another essay. It's in the function in the field essay, the great manifesto from the 50s of psychoanalysis, where he talks about this as the hic et nunc, the here and now from ancient poetry, in which all things run together in a constant state of becoming. It's some mystical shit but it's a great lead as to what he's up to here. Libido is the organ for that experience. And what gets lost is its undivided status. When the symbolic cuts in, the undivided status of life is lost. Here, we're looking at something even more primitive perhaps than the symbolic. And that is the bipolarities of sexuation. Even before we have these primitive uteromorphic experiences of having a placenta separate from us, even before that, there's something happening when the primary caregiver, pregnant or otherwise, is painting the walls of your bedroom blue, is picking out a name for you derived from a grandfather. Even before you emerge as an individual, you are not just signified, encrusted with signifiers, but you're sexed. That's what Lacan is after here. Here's the issue with that though, the more important part and what gets us to the real. The real lack, what makes this a real lack, is the fact that when you are sexed, subject to the bipolarities of sex, you now have a relationship to death. And death is as real as it gets. The reason why this is important and the reason why Lacan is saying all this requires us to dip a little bit further back in this text before we continue with page 205. For my money, it's page 150. Around page 150, Lacan is introducing the notion of sex, almost as if to ask and answer a question, why haven't we been talking more about sex in Lacan's seminars? We're in seminar 11, where's sex in all this? Page 150 begins, let us look at the facts. Time is of essence. Scroll down to the last line of the second full paragraph. We know that sexual division, insofar as it reigns over most living beings, is that which ensures the survival of a species. 
Lacan is a philosopher of science and biology. Get ready, here it comes. Whether with Plato we place the species among the ideas, or whether we say with Aristotle that it is to be found nowhere but in the individuals that support it, hardly matters here. Let us say that the species survives in the form of its individuals. Nevertheless, the survival of the horse as a species has a meaning. Each horse is transitory and dies. So you see the link between sex and death, sex and death of the individual is fundamental. What happens when the bipolarities of sex are dropped on your ass is that you now are subject to something that wasn't there before. And this is reproduction. Libido before reproduction was a certain type of X factor enjoyment. I hesitate to even use the word enjoyment because jouissance is not how we would describe that either. Even the best Lacanians struggle to find a word for this lived experience prior to sexuation and oftentimes resort to a certain type of jouissance. There is even a passage in seminar 10 where Lacan himself slips, but not too far because for him, he puts jouissance there in quotation marks as if he himself is struggling for a term for this. That enjoyment though is split and barred when sexuality enters the picture. And sexuality brings with it its own kind of dialectic. Its primary dialectic is between reproduction at the level of a species and death at the level of the individual. So in order for a reproduction to occur and for a species to persist, individuals in this dynamic, horses and humans alike, have to get together and fuck. What also has to happen though is the biological finality of fucking, which is dying. The individuals that allow the species to live perish in a way that the species does not. That's what makes this earlier lack, earlier than the cut introduced by the no of the father. The lack that is earlier is real because it puts the subject this may be even the first flourish of subjectification on the path to death. Here's that link. Signifiers are connected to death because they allow absence to be made present. Hence the example of the burrito. I can talk about elephants too, and they can all go fucking die. I don't want that shit to happen. I love elephants, elephants are dope. But if elephants go and die, I still have the signifier. And there's a very real sense in which as soon as I have that signifier, it's always a pronouncement of their death. My grandmother, as some of you know, was raised on a farm and she was never allowed to name the animals. I said, grandma, why, why can't you name the animals? Why, what was that a big deal about? Because cow, cows are cute, right? She said, my dad wouldn't let me name the animals because they're not pets. They're not members of the family, that's product. That's what we make. No naming of animals so that when it's time for the slaughter, you don't fucking cry. You get the job done. There's a reason why whenever you want to take over a small country, hell, a big country, one of the first things you do is fuck with their tombstones. Change their names. Assign them numbers instead of names. You strip them of their signifiers. Easier to kill a number than it is to kill somebody with a name like yours, a name that also belongs to somebody you know, maybe even love. Signifiers are tinged with death for this reason. They pronounce loss, absence. But what Lacan's getting at here is another connection that we have to death that is more primitive, more primordial. Don't forget also that Lacan understands the fragmented body 
at the start of the mirror stage in all this business, this bumbling, discombobulated baby in front of the mirror, he sees that early stage, which we call the fourth trimester, when this worm-like human organism is doing nothing because they lack gross and fine motor skills, he also refers to that as being tinged with death. The baby newly born is not at the start of life. They're right on the verge of death. Think about that. We call it the fourth trimester because that motherfucker wasn't ready to come out. Put that baby back in, needs to cook a little longer. It came out early. A baby that comes out early that can't stand up and do its own thing the way a horse could when it's first born, you can put it in the corner of the room and walk away. Whether you're gone for five minutes or five weeks, that baby will still be there when you come back. It may be more or less dead by the time you come back, but it ain't going anywhere. Lacan's point about the fragmented body, this early stage of child development, the origin of the mirror stage too, because I know some of you are interested in that, is that this is a body tinged with death. It's not at the start of life. It's just hanging on to life. It more closely approximates death. I forget where he says it. It's somewhere in a creed. Here, though, we're going back a little further, because before that baby came slithering out, whether by slice or slice, it was sexed, put on the trajectory towards individual death. And whatever type of enjoyment, if you will, quotation marks around enjoyment, it had at the level of pure undivided life has now been sundered, split, divided, shoved aside, suppressed by the straits of sexuality, where enjoyment is subordinate to reproduction, where you enjoy genital contact because it enables reproduction. Or as evolutionary scientists would say, it's because genitals enable reproductive processes to occur that genitals feel good. The concentration of nerve endings in certain origins, usually swimsuit zones, has everything to do with the propagation of the species. But what we also know, as Lacan is pointing out here, is that the blow of individual death is at play here as well. As soon as this happens, you have fallen under the blow of individual death. What's going to happen next on page 205 is a shift into this topic that brings us again to the very end of seminar 11, love. Who wants to read? Somebody new, somebody whose voice we haven't yet heard yet because damn if the invocatory drive ain't tough to figure out. Starting with Aristophanes, myth. Speak up, y'all. I'll read it. Thank you. All right. Aristophanes myth pictures the pursuit of the complement for us in a moving and misleading way by articulating that it is the other, one sexual other half, that the living being seeks in love. To this mythical representation of the mystery of love, analytic experience substitutes the search by the subject, not of the sexual complement, but of the part of himself lost forever that is constitutive, constituted by the fact that he is only a sex living being and that he is no longer immortal. Boom, thank you, brilliant, yes. Okay, you ever see those necklaces that people wear and it's like, and it's like a heart but it's been broken in half and you have the one half and it's got the little jagged thing and you give the other half to your dog or your cat or your African gray parrot. And when the two of you are together, you like come together and you're now a whole creature. You ever hear that bullshit? You complete me. This is my love line to you. You complete me. And then they break up and they're, and they're gone. And you're like, I feel like I've lost something. I'm not complete. I feel like I've lost an appendage. You were my great appendage. I can't believe I lost you. It's like losing a leg. You were my fourth leg. I'm so sad. Um, this is the Aristophanes myth, is that you're always searching for your other half. And that when you come together, like the broken parts of a heart necklace, the full heart, 
is made. Wait, how do we do that? Is that it? No, wait, that's it. Better, better. No, no. Pumpkins. It's almost Halloween. Pumpkins. Heart. No. Um. Yeah, lacan's like that ain't what we're up to. We're not looking for our other half. What we're looking for is something else. A part of ourselves lost forever. One thing to remember about psychoanalysis, it does not seek, it finds. So the very prospect of looking for something does not comport in theory or technique with Lacan's thought. The part of ourselves lost forever that is constituted by the fact that we are only sexed living beings. And as a result, we are no longer immortal. What the is he doing with immortal? We're going to come to it. Pausing there for a moment, I'll take another shift. You will now understand, for the same reason, that it is through the lure that the sexed living being is induced into his sexual realization. The drive, the partial drive, is profoundly a death drive. It represents in itself the portion of death in the sex living being. Okay, let's go ahead and just answer one of the basic questions that we all have about the drive. Why does Lacan always say that every drive is a death drive? There are some good reasons for this. Drives pursue their own extinction in order to rise like a phoenix again. Drives are tinged with pain sometimes. Not all the time, thank you, but sometimes. Drives are also repetitive, but that ain't why they're death drives. They are death drives because they are plugged into this primitive moment where the living organism is thrown into the bipolar straits of sexuality. It's by way of the drive that we reacquaint ourselves with that which has been lost forever, with our own immortality. Let's just be brazen about this. The drive is our portal to an immortality that has been lost forever. And the drive is connected somehow, we have to figure out how, to this portion of death in the sexed living being this individual blow of death. The secret, I would suggest, will come to us when we arrive at the object of the drive, but we're not there yet. Thus defying perhaps for the first time in history, that's a big ass claim, thus defying perhaps for the first time in history. Some of you who know me in other contexts, my primary job is as an intellectual and cultural historian. Anytime somebody shows up and says, for the first time in history, I'm like, damn, okay, let's see what this is about. That's a big claim. A myth that has acquired so much prestige and which last time I placed under the same heading as Plato places that of Aristophanes, I substituted the myth intended to embody the missing part, which I call the myth of the lamella. You've heard it before, we're gonna dig in. The lamella. This is new. And it is important because it designates the libido, not as a field of forces, but as an organ. Drives have lots of erogenous zones, but they have only one organ. The libido is the essential organ in understanding the nature of the drive. This organ is unreal. Unreal is not imaginary. The unreal is defined by articulating itself on the real in a way that it loses. And it is precisely this that requires that its representation should be mythical. This is another word that Lacan typically associates with this here and now of the all in a process of becoming that was there before the symbolic in terms of lived organic experience. But the fact that it is unreal does not prevent an organ from embodying itself. What we're after here is that organ. One more step back and we'll have it. Page 197.
197 starts popping with the lamella. This is probably a passage you've seen before. Whether you've read it as we're about to read it remains to be seen. The lamella, he tells us toward the bottom, is something extra flat, which moves like the amoeba. It goes everywhere. It is related to what the sexed being loses in sexuality. It is like the amoeba in relation to sexed beings, immortal, because it survives any division, any cisiparous intervention, and it can run around. <laughs> well, this is not very reassuring, but suppose it comes and envelops your face while you are quietly asleep. You all have seen this movie. Do I even need to quote this movie? How many times has some Lacanian chimed in on this passage and been like, bro, that's aliens. That's the alien, you know, like Ridley Scott's movie, man. That's the alien. It glitz on your face, man. And it moves around. It's like this pure life force. That's not incorrect. That shit is true. My question, dear Ridley Scott, if you're out there, um, did you read this? Are you aware of this? Is this where you got it from? I think it was Ridley Scott, I forget. We're moving on here to the bottom of 197. This lamella, this organ, whose characteristic is not to exist, but which is nevertheless an organ. I can give you more details as to its zoological place is the libido. It is the libido, pay attention here y'all, qua pure life instinct, that is to say, immortal life or irrepressible life, life that has need of no organ. I wonder who else read this passage? One Deleuze, one Guattari perhaps? Are we talking about a body without organs? We'll see. Simplified, indestructible life it is precisely what is subtracted from the living being by virtue of the fact that it is subject to the cycle of sex reproduction. So this pure, immortal, irrepressible, organless, simplified, indestructible life embodied in the organ of the libido is what is subtracted from the living being when they are subject to the cycle of sex reproduction. At the end of sex reproduction, is the final blow to the individual known as death. So we're kind of stitching this all together into a single statement. And it is of this that all the forms of the objet that can be enumerated are the representatives, the equivalents. The objets a are merely its representatives, its figures. So let's be clear about this. You have all of these objects the cigarette that you smoke, which is a metonymic stand-in for the breast. But the breast is a metonymic stand-in for something else, libido. So I want you to first start thinking about drive and its object as a series of metonymic substitutions from the trope metonymy, which means to change name in Greek. It's a changing of names, like a field progresses from corn to soybeans to hogs. Metonymy is about this substitutive move, which is how Freud could, whether he knew it or not, come up with the trope of displacement or dreams. Could, could you flush that a little more with some examples? Could you repeat that and give us a little more examples of the, the chaining? We will, we absolutely will. We're just getting started with this. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the way it would work is every single drive is going to have what I will call imaginary objects on which we are fixated. Those imaginary objects, little i, little a's, they're specular images, are hooked into and they are substitutes for more primitive little a's which are usually associated with certain erogenous zones, certain objects and things that are produced out of these zones. So the examples would be, in the case of an oral drive, you may have the cigarette or the fingernail you like to chew on or the toothpick that's always in your mouth, which is a stand-in for the breast, 
which is a stand-in for libido. Anal drive. You may have all that money in the bank that you like to check on with these raising interest rates. Money is a stand-in for feces, which is the partial object of the anal drive. Feces, though, is a stand-in for libido. You see, they all come back to this primitive, pure, undivided life force, the first loss, the first obje ah, if you will, the primary loss, das ding, if you read seminar seven, is this loss of libido. And that loss occurs when the straits of sexuality are imposed on the living organism. And remember, the primary antinomy in the straits of sexuality is between reproduction at the level of the species and death at the level of the individual. That's what, we're up, that's what we're up to here. So we can go on and on and on. You could say the same thing about, I don't know, the invocatory drive. The dog owner telling the dog to speak and the dog barks and everybody claps. Oh, what a, what a well-trained dog you have. Yeah, um, the voice of the dog would be a stand-in for another voice which is the partial object of the invocatory drive, which is a stand-in for libido. Scopic drive, all them little hearts that we so love on Instagram. And don't get me wrong, I love that shit. Thank you all for your support on Instagram. Appreciate you. That legit, it's totally legit. But those are imaginary objects that we're fixated on. Sublimations, if you will, we'll come to that, of the gaze which is the partial object of the scopic drive. And the gaze is a substitute for, you guessed it, libido. This on page 198 is where Lacan is telling you what the original loss was. So don't worry, we'll come back with more examples. Here's one just to throw at you, reading on on page 198, the breast. As equivocal as an element characteristic of the mammiferous organization. The placenta, for example, there's another one, certainly represents that part of himself that the individual uses at birth and which may serve to symbolize the most profound lost object. That most profound lost object is libido. The placenta symbolizes libido. The breast symbolizes libido. And you see this in other places in Lacan too, especially when he starts talking about representatives of representatives, representation of the representative. Yeah, the big German term that he makes much of, Vorstellung's representants. What you see there <clears throat> is a series of metonymic representations of the drive. The Vorstellung represents a real event an actual body on fire in the other room. Here the Vorstelling would be the voice of the child, the speech of the child who shows up and says, Father, can't you see I'm burning? The smell perhaps in the room. But then you've got this representance of the Vorstelling, which would be the dream. Same thing is happening here. You've got a real lack that is occurring at the level of the referent for all other lost objects, libido. And then you've got these little a's, breast, feces, gaze, voice primarily, the traditional partial objects of the drive. And then beyond those, you've got these imaginary objects that are sublimated versions of those partial objects, breast, feces, gaze, voice. So you see there's like a hierarchy here. What we're working at right now is at the base of it. We're trying to figure out what it was and what's been lost to get this cycle started. One more pass at it, and then we'll get to some more discussion. It's on the next page, page 199. About the middle of the page, the paragraph begins, the relation to the other. The relation to the other is precisely that which for us brings out what is represented by the lamella. Not sexed polarity, the relation between masculine and feminine, but the relation between the living subject and that which he loses by having to pass for his reproduction through the sexual cycle. So what is at stake in this sexed polarity? Again, 
is the relationship between us as living beings, but also as subjects, which is where we started, a living subject, and what we lose in becoming living subjects, sexed beings, by having to pass for our reproduction through the sexual cycle. In this way, I explain the essential affinity of every drive with the zone of death. Here it is again. Every drive is a death drive because it is also connected to this strait of sexuality that we have to pass through in order to become living subjects. This is like, this is before we get to talk of castration. This is before the no name of the father. This is before some of that shit. This is primitive. And that's why it's so interesting because this is one of the great passages where you hear this in Lacan. In this way, I explain the essential affinity of every drive with the zone of death and reconcile the two sides of the drive, which at one and the same time makes present sexuality in the unconscious and represents in its essence, death. I wanna say one more thing about this. The following line, Lacan goes to the unconscious and he says, you will also understand if I have spoken to you of the unconscious as of something that opens and closes, the most important part of what he's saying there is the opening and the closing. The unconscious emerges as a kind of opening of something that could otherwise be closed. You see, transference is what happens when the opening whereby some symptom, if you will, some expression of the unconscious would emerge, would be expressed like a turd, is closed. Transference is important, according to Lacan, because it's closure of the opening that the unconscious has access to is significant. It tells you, even if you don't get anything out of that opening, where it is. The transference, the point of the transference that marks a closing of the unconscious is incredibly significant for this reason, according to Lacan. Even though it's a shutting down of the unconscious, it still tells you that there's a portal to the unconscious right there. It's the X that marks the spot where the digging can occur. And that's what he's after here. I flag it for you because this is the exact same structure that every single erogenous zone that is attached to the drive also has. They are openings, mouths on the human body that have a rim-like structure and with the exception of the outer ear, which is significant, can all be closed. I can close my eyes and open them. I can close my mouth and open them. Your anus, thank goodness, is usually closed. But by God, if you can't open that. The opening and closing function of the erogenous zone is absolutely crucial to how the drive operates, but also how the unconscious operates. And I'd say conceptually, that's the big stake here. We're gonna to come to the source we're gonna to come to all four parts of the drive. But right now, I just wanna flag this for you. The unconscious for Lacan operates like a series of pulses when it finds expressions. It opens up and in a burst, something comes out and then it usually closes right back up. Our job is to make sense and come to terms with those little outbursts, if you will. Let's take a couple of questions. It's been a lot so far. We're about an hour into it, and I want to make sure you have a chance to feed back. I'm not really paying much attention to the chat, unfortunately. So by all means, turn your mic on, ask a quick question if you've got one. We won't spend a lot of time with questions because I know you want to get to more of the meat, but I do think it's important to pause for a question or two. I just had a real, real quick question. <clears throat> I don't know if it's too ableist in its thinking, but isn't this closing the ears. I mean, you have to have the ability to close your ears. 
but could that be considered a closure of that er er erogenous zone? Yeah, it could. <clears throat> I mean, we have all these ways that we close our ears. Um, Lacan never tires of referring to the biblical passage about how we have ears in order not to hear. So selective hearing, we have, there's a lot you can do here with hearing. Um, there are some, there are some great, there are some great stuff out on the human voice and, and auditory channels and the like. Um, I think it's interesting that the ear can't be closed and you can see the drives when they're operating, they're going everywhere. So recall, for instance, the famous passage um, in St. Augustine, where he takes one of his homies to the gladiatorial games and the guy is so fucking horrified. It's like watching Dahmer on Netflix, man. It's like, you can close your eyes, but you can't close your ears. And that's what Augustine points out. He's like, ah, alas, he could close his eyes and shut down in a sense, the scopic drive perhaps, but he could not close his ears. And I would just add one more thing to that, just by way of illusion. You ever have those experiences when you're just starting to fall asleep for a nap or whatever, and suddenly your ears and your hearing start to become a little more like acute? Like you can just hear things are kind of a little bit louder and all these noises, it's almost like that part of the sensory manifold gets turned up as this part of the sensory manifold gets turned down for sleep. It's important to have this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Why did Van Gogh slice off his ear? <laughs> so that we could laugh about it now, of course. No, it's, it's legit. It's unfortunate people be slicing off their own ears and stuff like that. But you know what? You know what he didn't do, which he probably should have done? Put that shit in a skillet and eat it. Auto cannibalism is so completely real. You can go down to Mexico. I could go down to Mexico, maybe easier than some of you, but you can go down to Mexico right now. I could have my foot amputated. I could be back by Friday and having my homies over for foot tacos. I could be making that shit up. That's real. Auto cannibalism is a very interesting move here. It's relevant to the drive because the first active stage of the drive is usually autoerotic. You all are this, awesome. this is great. Yep, tonight. This is the two, two quick questions. I was wondering just, um, I have a basic understanding of part objects, but not like, you know, tons and tons. Could you say maybe briefly about like, kind of like, uh, like you know, Freud to, Freud to Lacan on part objects, and secondly, just thinking about like, um, so I work with ASL sometimes, which is different than speaking one word at a time. So I can be signing with one hand, like in a chain versus holding one sign, which I was also thinking about. I remember one of your courses, you talk about, again, this idea of the, the sentence is how we progress. But then if you think about, the, the, the drumming in a certain sense. So we hear the melody progressing, but then the brain likes a, if you want to call it a polyrhythm or two things going forward and pausing. So it's just wondering, as opposed to that idea that we had the line going forward and then the end, you know everything about the dynamic between, if you want to call it like a, a drum holding the, I forget the ostinato as things progress. And then second, if you could just say something quickly, just a little more about part objects and, and, and what we're talking about. Yeah, I'll try, Jim. Um, and I'll try also to just be um, quick, but also elusive here. Um, elusive, not elusive. I don't want to be elusive, but here I go anyway. Um, what we know about Lacan's approach to analysis, as he's spelling it out for folks in the 50s. In the 1950s, Lacan is pretty clear that the centerpiece of analysis, as you heard me say, is speech. And the first song that he heard in analysis is empty speech. Well, that puts the analyst in a very peculiar position as auditor, more precisely for Lacan as addressee. And the question then is, how do you respond to the analyzant's empty speech, to their ego speech? Do you reject it? Do you acknowledge it? Do you ignore it? Any move you make is going to be a response, even if you don't make a move. Lacan, though, shifts away from that pretty quickly and wants to just talk about hearing. And it's important to note here because the, the image that he calls to mind in the 50s is that of a musical score. He thinks that listening to human speech would be like studying a, the score for a symphonic performance. 
where you would have different instruments playing different things at different parts and you're listening to them all at once as they move through. Listening would be something that would occur at multiple registers. And I think that in keeping with what he's doing there, we could also say that this is what it would mean to be a great analyst in the room with somebody. Now, one of my friends, great friend, Lacanian, he has switched totally to the phone. He meets with all of his analyzands just strictly through the phone. I won't tell you who he is because you probably know him. It's all through phone. And I said, bro, what the fuck? You can't, what, what about all the nonverbal channels that would come in with, with analysis? He says, listen, man, the centerpiece of Lacanian psychoanalysis is the voice, speech. That's all I need. I can do everything I need to do with them and read all that needs to be read at the level of the voice. Smart claim, interesting claim, maybe brazen. I was a little stunned, but nevertheless, you know, it's somebody I regard highly, so here we are. In the room though, you would have all these other channels going. So as some of you know, my doctorate is in communication. And one of the things that I was early on very interested in is in all of these channels beside and against language. So you have a linguistic channel, which would capture the verbiage, all the words that you're hearing me say right now. You would also have a paralinguistic channel, which would include the contours of the voice, how long my pauses are between the end of this sentence and the beginning of the third. Inhalations, exhalations, speeding up of speech. In other words, the contours of your words. So there's a verb and then there's voice. But at the same time, when you're dealing with embodied social interaction, there's also a nonverbal channel, which includes all kinds of stuff. Haptics, touch. Oculesics, the study of eye movement when you're talking with somebody. Gestures, of course, are in there, including holding a sign and using ESL as you are at the same time doing things with speech. My point here is that the thick medium of human speech requires a thicker ability to describe it that moves beyond one single human medium of the ear and the listener. It would also include the eyes. Olfactics is also a part of nonverbal communication. How the patient smells when they arrive at your office matters. And let me tell you something, analysts, your offices smell weird. I'm just gonna tell you this. I've been in some offices and your offices smell strange. Actually, most of them are in San Francisco and the buildings are really old. So it kind of has something to do with that. Smell matters. Eye movement matters, touch matters, or lack thereof. I can remember one time with an analyst, with my primary analyst, um, just saying that I need a hug. And she was down, but let me tell you, it was the weirdest fucking hug in the world. I got the hug, but it was weird. It was absolutely strange. Can't really explain it. Can't really explain it. Dahmer could probably explain it, but I don't know what it meant. So all of these channels would be firing at once. With them, there would be multiple drives. With them, there would be multiple partial objects that can be switched around. The aging breast turns to shit. I enjoy shitting on beautiful breasts. So there are these ways that you can move between them. We'll come to it, but first, I think we need to get a little more like understanding of the structure of the drive. And then we'll start messing with the objects. Don't worry, Jim, it's coming. All right, y'all, you ready to launch forward? Anybody else got a burning question? Okay. Um, let's summarize what we've got going here so far. All drives are death drives on account of their relation to the living subject within the sexual cycle. Let me be clear. Sexed being is a deadly being. And you can Google search that, that shit's Lacan. Sexed being is a deadly being. It is lethal because it subordinates the libido as pure undivided life to the bipolarities of sexual reproduction at the level of the species. But here's the hook. Again, 
a species only survives in the form of its individuals insofar as they reproduce, but each individual, each member of the species is transitory. The horses that made the one that lives in the field behind your house are transitory. They may die, but that doesn't mean they take the whole species with them. This is what we're getting at. Atop this summary, I wanna add something, something that some of you have heard before something that you may have noticed in your reading of Lacan. It's this quote from Heraclitus on page 177 of Seminar 11. To the bow, bios, is given the name of life, bios, and its work is death. Now it's a pun. By shifting the accent above the I and the O around, Heraclitus is able to talk about bow as in like bow and arrow, but also about life. And what he's able to do is to talk about something happening here in this mashup of life and death. You may refer to life as bios, but make no mistake, the work of life is death. We are programmed to die. And it's a damn good thing that we do because I don't think this planet could foster any more humans. To recover one's libido at the level of the drive in the field of enjoyment, apart from the demands of others, and thus our own desires, is to recover an unreal because pre-real, pre-existent mythical experience of life in the midst of death. And here I'm foreshadowing where we're headed. At stake in recovering one's libido at the level of the drive is not just a simple sense of jouissance, <clears throat> but an experience of life in the midst of death, in the field of death, by way of absence instantiated by the signifier. You know the field of death I'm talking about, where absence is instantiated by the signifier? It's castration. It's the very same reason why in the graph of desire, the mathing for the drive appears not on the side of jouissance, but on the side of castration. It is in the midst of the death inaugurated by language acquisition, which began with the name of the father. Another concept that we could spend a couple of sessions on. It's there that the drive finds enjoyment. Or at least it's there that the drive then launches, if you're looking at the graph of desire, the return arc back, back towards jouissance. But it is in the field of death, death inaugurated by the signifier. Because remember, I can talk about elephants and they can all fucking die, but I can still talk about elephants. That foreshadowing coupled with the Heraclitus quote, <coughs> it brings us to this definition of the drive that I gave earlier, drive as montage. The prevailing image that Lacan provides of the drive looks a lot like an arrow that is shot, but that strangely also returns back to the shooter. You know the image I'm talking about, right? Let me see if I can pull it up for you here. I'm gonna share my screen and hope for the best here. As some of you know, who have been in seminars and the like with me in the past, this is sometimes where things get a little bit weird when I start shifting to the pen tab, but we're gonna do it anyway. Of course, we're gonna do it. All right, do you all see this diagram? Somebody, somebody shout out that you can see this so I make sure, all right, Christopher, thank you. Um, what we have here is the basic diagram of the drive that Lacan gives us in seminar 11. You can track it down on your own, but this is pretty much it. And what I wanna show you is first of all, the arrow. 
you see the arrow, right? It comes out from a source with a rim-like structure. And I'll go ahead and start writing some of this stuff in for us. Here's your source with a rim-like structure. This is also going to be, I'm gonna abbreviate it here, an erogenous zone. This is the mouth, this is the anus, this is the outer ear, this is the eye. The drive has its source in some kind of an opening, but the aim, the way that it travels, its operation, is kind of weird. In fact, for the French out there, the drive is drifty. It has a drift to it. Here's how it drifts. It comes out, but then oddly enough, unlike any arrow you've ever shot, if you're lucky, it comes back. Now, as somebody trained in instinctive archery, one of the things I love to do more than anything on the archery field is just shoot an arrow straight up in the air and then run like hell. No, but usually then like hide behind something just to see it come down near me. It's a bad tendency. It's not recommended on the archery course, but nevertheless, it's one of the only experiences when the arrow comes back to you, shooting straight up in the air. That life death bow that Heraclitus is talking about, it's no coincidence that if you wanna know the page where this diagram comes up, it's on the page exactly after Lacan presents the Heraclitus quote. The arrow is key here. Drives typically, typically have four features, functional features. The first we can write down here, it would be like the thrust. And the thrust is constant. This is like from Freud to Lacan, but Lacan's always gonna add something even though he says he's just doing what you know, Freud says. The thrust is constant, it's not rhythmic which in other words, it's not biological. That's important here. The drive has an energy behind it that is constant, that never goes away. It doesn't wane. It's not a moon. It's a constant thrust. When the drive is operationalized, it, if you will, comes out and it has an aim. The aim of the drive though is drifty, and circuitous and has a return to it. The aim of the drive is to return to the source from which it came. And the thrust gives it the energy to do so. But what I would suggest is that it is the gravitational pull of the object of the drive. that allows it to make that return. And I would just suggest to be clear that the gravitational pull put forth by the object is not that of a planet, asteroid, moon. It's that of an opening. You see little a, I want you to think black hole. It's the gravitational pull of an opening, not an entity. The object of the drive is not a thing. It may look like a thing. It may look like the cigarette that you're pulling out of the box. It is not. The proper object of the drive is not an object, but an opening. We'll come to it in a second because this opening is usually plugged with stuff. I wanna emphasize this to know that the object here is something that is circled around. That's why I've drawn this little arrow around A. Whatever it is, if this is an oral drive, little A here could be a breast. 
or more than likely it would be a stand-in for the breast, a sublimated version of the breast at the level of, I don't know, let's say you have a water bottle that you always drink from that has a straw built into it. That might be the thing you reach for when you get a little nervous in a meeting. I don't fucking know. But the idea is that that straw could serve as a sublimation of the breast, which would occupy the space of imagine or, or of, of object ah here, because the breast would be something that's prohibited from you. And if you don't believe me, let me tell you this. Imagine yourself at a meeting. You and your water bottle are at an important meeting at work and you're feeling a little nervous. And you know what happens next? Your mother walks in, lifts up her shirt, exposing her bare breasts, walks over to where you're sitting at the table and presents it to you and says, suck. I'm here, are you thirsty, son? Daughter, I'm here. Can I, what would you like for lunch? It's almost lunchtime. Here's my breast. Yeah, you think you were nervous at the meeting causing you to grab that water bottle? This is how you know that it is a prohibited object. The partial objects of the drive are always objects that have been placed under erasure. They've been prohibited. The process of prohibition of the mother's breast would be called weaning. Doesn't mean you stopped wanting it even demanding it. It just means that you needed to find a substitute for the breast. So it could be the breast that becomes the bottle, that becomes the thumb that you suck, that becomes the nail that you bite, that becomes the straw of your water bottle, that becomes the cigarette, that becomes whatever the hell else that you might put in your mouth. And I wanna be clear, this is a really basic understanding of how the drives operate. It's never just about what you put in your mouth. The mouth is an in-out operation. This is what Kristeva understood about the human body and her theory of abjection. It's a marker of inner and outer. It's a place where those two worlds can access each other. The oral drive, in other words, has as much to do with what you put in your mouth as with what comes out of it. That's why Lacan has the famous example in seminar 11 of ordering food. The food that you order off the menu at the restaurant is as activating of your oral drive as the eating of that food when it arrives at your table 20 minutes later. The oral drive is about the in-out operation of the mouth. It's not about objects. It's about openings that operate. The source of the drive, the erogenous zone of the mouth, the fence of the teeth, as Homer put it, mirror structurally the object of the drive, which is also an opening. Obje a is not a thing. It's the minimum irreducible distance between two entities that allows them to remain distinct and appear as such. It's a gap, it's an opening. We'll come to it in a second when we talk about the object more directly. Right now, I just wanna get all four parts out there. The thrust is constant. The source is an opening with a remnant-like structure, an erogenous zone, mouths all over the human body. The aim of the drive is drifty, circuitous, and always returning. That return, I would just add, is part of what allows for drive satisfaction. And it is beyond the pleasure principle, my friends. This is satisfaction beyond pleasure and its flip side which is on the same coin, which is displeasure. This is something else. The satisfaction of the drive returning to its source, of that arrow sizzling down from the sky to land in the soil at your feet is different from pleasure and displeasure as regulated by the pleasure principle. The object of the drive I would say for us is the first and foremost thing we need to talk about. It's an opening represented by OBJI, which we will define. Here's what else though, it's fucking variable. When you start talking about the vicissitudes of the drive, which the best translation of which, better than vicissitudes even is just adventures. You know, I mean, if you go back into the German, it starts talking about like fate and destiny, but really what we're talking about is an adventure. The drive is an adventure where some energy comes out, 
circles around an object and then returns back to you. The object around which the drive circles is an opening plugged with all manner of things. The stuff that you put in your mouth, for instance, is wildly variable to the point of being like, the drive is almost indifferent. Everybody's gonna have a different set of objects for an oral drive. A lot of them will be fairly similar. Like I doubt that the object of your oral drive is gonna be a car because try fitting that in your mouth. There's something limiting here about the human form, but nevertheless, what you put in your mouth is wildly different from what others put in their mouths, some ways extreme. But the point here is that it's variable. The drive, remember, all drives are death drives. They trace their origin back to libido, which in turn gets connected to all these partial objects that have been prohibited, constrained, whether it's the breast, feces, the gaze, or someone's voice. And then there are all these sublimated versions of those objects. The voice that is prohibited, that connects to libido, is substituted with the bark of the dog when you say speak. The invocatory drive operates at both levels. Our job is to understand how to get from those imaginary objects that plug the hole back to the hole that can be treated as a portal back to libido. So like I said, thrust and aim, they're fairly clear. Thrust is constant and aim is circuitous. Object and source are more complicated and for my money, way more interesting. So let's start with the object. Let's get through the object and maybe take a break. I mean, you can always take a break. Don't worry, this is gonna be a recorded session. But maybe we need a break after we do some object. It's gonna require us to think a little bigger and broader because obviously if the object of the drive is object little a, we got some work to do as Lacanians, right? This is such a central concept. So let's start big and basic. Is psychoanalysis a science? You damn straight. But it is not like most modern sciences. Most modern sciences are concerned with stuff, with objects. Psychoanalysis is not concerned with stuff in the sense of objects. It's concerned with openings in the sense of causes, what causes or allows objects to appear in a phenomenological field. That's what interests psychoanalysis. To the point that you might even say, if modern science is obsessed with objectivity, psychoanalysis, it is more concerned with something called objectality objectality, which according to Lacan is not a study of stuff in the world. It's a study of causes. It is a study of the conditions of possibility for the appearance of anything like an object in a world to be studied by modern science. This is in many ways why psychoanalysis trumps modern science, because it's less concerned with the objects of scientific inquiry than it is with the conditions of possibility for any certain object to pop as an entity to be studied in the first place. Now let's take a simple example. This amazing pen, you see it? It's black, it's right here. You also see the wall behind me, which is white. Here's what I would suggest. In order to have a pen to study and consider, you have to have two other entities. In other words, in order to count to one, you first have to count to three. Here's why. In order for this pen to appear as something in the foreground for us to consider and look at, it has to be distinguished, distinguishable from a background that allows it to appear. You see, if the wall were painted black, you might not see this pen there would be no distinction perceptible. 
But there's also this third element. The third element is the minimum irreducible difference between the blackness of this pen and the whiteness of that wall. There is a gap or a line or a cut, a single stroke, a furrow between this pen in the foreground and that wall in the background. This is the cleanest, if most philosophical definition of objea that we have. It's the minimum irreducible difference or distance between two entities that allows them to appear distinct. Objet A is the minimum irreducible distance between two entities that allows them to remain distinct, or at least to appear different. That's that third element. If you were to remove that third element, you would not have two entities anymore. They would suddenly merge together into one. Those of you that listen to our podcast, you heard me recently talk about a cup of water. Make that two cups of water. If you have a half cup of water and you pour some from another glass into it, in that cup of water, you now don't have two separate fields of water. Now, maybe at a molecular level, you might get there. But what you have is one bigger cup of water the distance and distinction between those two bodies of water has gone away. Obje a is whatever is there as a space or a gap, a demarcation that allows two entities to appear distinct. The object of the drive as Obje a, which you can see here in Lacan's diagram is no exception. I would also add alluding to what we're gonna do next week, that the object of the drive sometimes looks a lot like that of anxiety. Anxiety is not without an object, Lacan tells us. And the reason why he puts it that way is because the object of anxiety is not really an object at all. It is in fact an opening. See, that's what makes us anxious is when a desirous other approaches us and takes that gap from us. The lack that we would use to cultivate our own desire is now squished by the overweening desire of somebody else, oftentimes a primary caregiver, a stand in for the big other. That's anxiety where lack is lacking, where that opening, that minimum distance that I need to remain and experience myself as distinct from you is now gone. And I'm smothered and swallowed and consumed by this devouring other. That's fucking anxiety. That's what it amounts to, is when that minimum irreducible distance has been reduced and closed or is threatened to be reduced or closed. So the opening that the drive circles around is not unlike the opening that in moments of anxiety is taken from us by a desirous other. Can and I ask a question, Sam, for the clarity? Ability. Yeah, go ahead. Could you give us an example from like a movie or something or what you know with people with again how you're describing LJI here like I I kind of kind of got it partly but I kind of got lost with like kind of the use in psychoanalysis. Could you give us an example with like uh like instance, like, you know, like maybe from something like a movie or something. No. Or or just like another thing besides you were saying that like with, um, I, I, uh, I'm just trying to um, like how Objet has been explained to me before. This seems all, I'm trying, I'm missing part of it. If you could sort of say it another way with like, besides the issue, besides showing us the pen. Yeah. Um, no, I can, I will, it'll come to it but just hold off for a second. I don't want to get sidetracked down into this objet ah stuff. Okay. What you want to think of it as is the experience of lack. So for instance, I'm driving down, oh, here I go again. Now I'm getting back into the example. I just told you I wasn't going to do it. And now here I am doing it. I'm doing exactly the thing that I said I wasn't going to do. What am I supposed to do here? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Listen, um, 
it's oftentimes talked about around desire that everybody knows what they want. I mean, obviously that's not true, but nevertheless, I'm sure you could list on a piece of paper, 10 things that you know you want. The question though is why do you want it? And the answer is always the same because you lack it, but it's more precise than that. Obje a is the experience of lack. It's a symbol of what it feels like to be missing something. So for instance, um, I don't have horns, but I don't experience myself as missing them. Obje a is a symbol. That little a is just a placeholder that Lacan uses to talk about the experience we have where we feel like we're missing something. The job of advertising is to continually produce obje a's. So my iPhone is ancient. It's a riot at bars. Everybody loves it when my phone hits the table. They're like, what the hell is that? And I'm surrounded in San Francisco by billboards for, I don't know, iPhone, what? It's not even, they don't advertise the phone anymore. Now it's just some weird image of a cat's eyeball. And that's what I'm supposed to want now. What am I missing in that moment? What's the experience of lack? The phone is the thing that if I get, I'm told the experience of lack will go away. What I'm missing though, what I'm missing, the object cause of my desire for the phone, Jim, that little A, is a loving relationship with my cat. If I get close enough to my cat to have a picture of, their, of her eyeball, let me tell you, I got two cats and a dog. At least one of those cats is gonna straight up murder me or at least try. They might wait. I think she'd probably wait until I fell asleep. And then she'd remember that I got all up in her face with my iPhone 6 and come in and murder my ass. Obje A here is not the phone. Obje A is the, the phone is the answer to my experience of lack. What I'm lacking is a beautiful cat in the first place. My cat is hideous. The cat in whose face I would get is a filthy, gnarly beast. I don't have a pretty cat. My cat's eyes aren't pretty. They aren't, they aren't deep. I lack that very thing. It's not the phone I lack. It's a cat worth photographing with a new phone that I lack. Obje A captures that experience of lack. And the job of advertising is always to produce the experience of lack. And I'll offer that as a very simple example so that you can then, each of us, can then go and notice the ways in your life that lack gets produced. It can be the teaser at the end of the episode that inclines you to watch yet another one. But it's the production of the experience of lack that we see over and over again when things are advertised to us. It's a great place to find terrific examples of obje a. There are so other more a, profound ones too, sure. but let's stop there. Because like I said, oh, okay. I, I don't want to get so, too- So just a tiny thing, I didn't quite understand the three verses too. If you were by your back wall, and there was a dark pen in the wall, that would be two things. I didn't quite understand the three that you were saying to set the situation up. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. So in order to have two entities, there has to be some sort of a distinction between them. And that distinction is a differential relation, but it is also an entity of its own. And that's the, that's the counterintuitive way that Lacan thinks here, is that the distinction between pen and wall it's neither pen nor wall. It is something in its own right. And that is what little a symbolizes. Little a always symbolizes a distance between two people, between two entities, a distinction. It's always a crack or an opening that allows those two entities to appear distinct. It doesn't have to be much. It can even be the minimum distance or difference but it is always at the level of a gap or an opening. Um, and the important thing for Lacan is to make that itself an entity. It's not just the relationship between two things. It is the relationship that now becomes the topic of interest. So that's the third element. So you'll hear me joke sometimes that in Lacan's thought, one plus one always equals three. Because in order to have two entities, you always have to have a third, which is their differential relationship. And he's getting this from his understanding of how language operates. Language operates in exactly the same way. Language is a differential system of signs. 
where you have cat and eyeball, perhaps in the same sentence and perhaps related to each other, but a cat doesn't equal an eye. Cats are fuzzy four-legged things that typically have eyes, but the eye is different from the cat. But in order to understand the cat, you have to look up the eye. And so you get this whole differential experience like working through a dictionary in a language you're just learning. Like the dictionary is in the foreign language. You ever encounter those? Like you try to learn um, like uh, Swahili or Twi and you get the dictionary and it's in Swahili or Twi and you're like, oh, because it's tough. If you're just learning the language, you look up the word and you see another word in the same language that you're learning. And now you have to look up that word too. And guess what? If you move in the same dictionary, it's gonna be written similarly in Twi or Swahili. So the idea here is that there's a differential relation that allows a language to operate. The signifiers are always related to other signifiers. Words like fuzzy, four-legged are part of what you need to understand a cat, but no one of them is equal to cat. Their relation is differential. And that's what language is. Language is a differential system of signs. And that's where Lacan's getting all this. What he has done with little a is found a, a vowel that he wants to assign to something that ain't this or that. That's the important part. The little a is always something that ain't, A-I-N-T. And that has a little a in it, so just remember it that way. It's always what ain't. The difference between the pen and the wall ain't the pen, and it ain't the wall. It's something else. So let's pause there for a second. Jim, if this is something that really intrigues you, I'm happy to hook you up with the stuff we did on seminar 10 and seminar 11, where this comes up and we talk through the lay more extensively. Um, so holler at me, and that goes for everybody. You know what? Like if you need, if you need, if you want more on this holler at me and we can talk um, more and I can certainly point you to some other stuff, even passages in Lacan that might be helpful. The point that we wanna get at here is how this opening that is little a emerges, the little a around which drive circulates. We know what's underneath it, libido, but how does it come about? How does the breast become the partial object of an oral drive? The answer in each drive is always the same, prohibition. The openings around which the drive circulates are usually plugged with stuff. The openings themselves though, emerge through an incisional process. Think incision like a scalpel that cuts into the skin, known as prohibition. In Lacanian terms, we refer to that as castration. But in each case, we see something similar happening, whether it's orality, anality, scopophilia, the same move is happening. I think it's worth trying to figure some of this stuff out. So let's try and be clear about this. Take the oral drive. The erogenous zone, the source, is gonna be the mouth, lips, teeth. The in-out operation or the aim of the drive that comes out, circles around an object and then returns is for the oral drive, some version of to suck. The real object of the drive, little a, is the breast. The imaginary object that plugs the hole where the prohibited breast used to be could be anything. The drive is indifferent. Even Freud figured this out right out of the gates. Drives go wherever the hell they find satisfaction. They'll glom on to anything. X, Y, Z, you name it. The cigarette is a classic example. It's a metonymic stand-in for a more primitive lost object, which in this case would be the breast that is prohibited through the process of weaning which is why it was so awkward when your mom showed up and wanted you to suckle. I would suggest that we can split this out pretty nicely and cleanly by the addition of another thing. 
little a is not an imaginary object. The cigarette in many ways is an imaginary object. It's something that you imagine and have put in the place of something that is gone, something that has been removed and is no longer there. The cigarette here is what plugs the hole left by the weaning process that stripped you of your source of nourishment in the case of the breast. Here's how I would phrase these. The imaginary objects that plug the hole around which a drive circulates, they're all bound up with logics of having. It's about stuff you can have. Cigarettes, or maybe you can't have those, maybe you shouldn't have those, and that might be all the reason more why you get off on them. Having though, is the logic of the imaginary object that plugs the hole left behind by a prohibitive process, a proto-castrative process known as weaning. At the level of objeado, it's not about having, it's about being. And this is a classic Lacanian dialectic that I want you to have in mind. It's not between appearance and being the philosophical distinction that Lacan works. It's at the level of having versus being. These are his two big ontological buckets. And you see this when he talks about the phallus, for instance, not the oral drive, not the anal drive, but like you talk about the phallic drive. Is it better to have the phallus or be the phallus? These are questions, questions that we've addressed elsewhere. I'm not gonna spend time on them now, but questions which I'm happy to talk with you about later, post a comment, whatever, I'm happy to reply. Right now, we're just working on the object. All right, anal drive. You know the erogenous zone, anus. The in-out operation has to do with shit. The in-out operation of the anus has to do with whether you hold it in or push it out. The verb, if you want, for the anal drive is to shit. And like all drives, it would have an active, reflexive, and passive voice. You get off on shitting on stuff. You get off on shitting on yourself. And you get off most intensely on making others shit on you, the passive voice. Now, I'm using shit here because it's a great one. Because that verb to shit on, it has strayed so far from feces as a literal piece of excrement to just mean giving somebody a hard time. Feces would be the partial object, the real object that is controlled and constrained in many ways prohibited through the process of potty training. Potty training says you don't just get to piss and shit wherever you want. There are proper times and places to potty train. That's how it works. Nevertheless, we find all these other ways to manipulate our shit. Look at all my shit. A great stand-in, metonymic stand-in at the level of an imaginary object that has to do with having more than being for feces would be money. The reason why money is dirty always is because it is fundamentally a stand-in for shit. This is how the objects work. An opening left by the prohibition against pissing and shitting wherever you want, known as potty training. The opening or the loss that potty training conditions becomes a cavity that you can then fill with money. Go ahead, Jason. Hey, I don't want to sidetrack us too much again, but like that's such a different order of sublimation between say a lollipop and money, you know, in terms of their link to, uh, you know, to an erogenous zone. I just wonder if you could talk 
about that a little bit? You know, my reading of Lacan on this point is that you're right. I mean, these are different orders of sublimation, but they proceed by the very same logic of sublimation that Lacan's tracing out in seminar seven. And it's a highly social normative process, whereby obviously things that are acceptable by a community or a collectivity are allowed to stand in for things that are prohibited by that collectivity. As far as Lacan's concerned, the sublimatory process there is always the same. I don't actually see him distinguishing between different types of sublimation at the level of socially appropriate stand-ins for prohibited objects. They're all for him kind of like nasty, shitty experiences that we nevertheless endure in order to get our little kicks off. What he does, however, have is a very strong process of what I would call desublimation. Maybe Les Marcuse uses it, but not with the repressive part on the front. The drive I read as a desublimatory process that works backwards from whatever the social sublimation is, whether it's a lollipop that stands in for the breast or money that stands in for shit. The logic of the drive, as I understand it, is to desublimate and move from those objects that plug the hole around which the drive circulates to have that hole opened up again. Not in order to rediscover the lost breast or in order to somehow like regain your relationship with feces and get off on that. Like I can finally um, you know, play with my turds in the bathtub again. That's not what it's about. Opening the hole doesn't allow you to replace lollipop with breast. It instead opens it up so that you can get down into something before the breast, this pure undivided libidinal experience. That's what the drive accesses. And that's why I use the, the phrase desublimation. Because as I understand sublimation, this would be a channeling of libidinal energies which aren't just sexual, they're just desires and impulses to tear shit up into socially acceptable outcomes. So you have a kid who's causing trouble, you give him a drum kit, focus that energy, sublimate it. The drive is a way to desublimate in a sense. So I guess, Jason, my thinking on this is first, I don't quite see the distinction between sublimatory processes that would result in a lollipop for a breast versus money for shit. But I say that with that original caveat, I don't work with patients and I know you do and word on the street is you're pretty damn good at it. So I imagine, this is Dr. Jason Childs, by the way, who's, who's, who's chiming in here. I imagine that, that you have seen this before and knowing you, I doubt your question came from nothing. So do you wanna add to this and explain how you see it differently and how these sublimatory processes would be of different qualities? Lollipop money? I'm trying to think about it because I, I, I thought your answer about desublimation actually made a lot of sense. Um, And you, you know the passage on uh, Yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. sorry. No, I was going to say, like, perhaps I can think about it and we can maybe return to it because I don't want to sort of, you know, bring things um, to a halt. I suppose uh, the one thing I would say is that, I, I mean, if I think of these as belonging to different orders of sublimation, it's that, I mean, the experience of a lollipop is actually firmly anchored in a in a um in your mouth right um but your experience of money isn't necessarily connected to sort of gut perturbations or something like that okay got it yeah so okay yeah so i was thinking something similar when i was thinking about like could you have an oral drive the object for which, the imaginary object for which, and I'm using imaginary object here, more or less non-technical, 
but mm. a car? And the answer is really like, well, probably not because a car does not comport with the erogenous zone of the human mouth, which yeah. involves things out and in, but it could. And I see what you're saying now, like money and shit are structurally, ontologically, scientifically quite different than lollipop mm. and breast, which are much closer in terms of their affinity and their likeness and their functionality. And I, I don't think that that's irrelevant. And in fact, mm. what I'd like to suggest is that we could make a move here that I think would be helpful. So Lacan really makes a big deal about the indifference of the drive relative to its objects. And that is in Freud as well. The idea mm. is that whatever the hell the drive gloms onto, it retroactively associates with the satisfaction it receives and says, okay, next time I feel that thrust or that energy that needs to be discharged in the Freudian sense, I'm gonna go look for an object like that. But if we read this a little more closely to the human form, I would say that there are some guardrails on this indifference. The vicissitudes of the drive, the variability that a drive can allow for in terms of object selection, I think it's much smarter than what we have from Lacan and Freud on this to think very closely about the connection between the object and the source. The thing that we, um, that, that brings us drive satisfaction when we mess with it, circle around it, and the source of that drive in whatever mouth on the human body it came from. I think the smart move here that you're suggesting is to say that we're not completely indifferent in object choice. It doesn't mean that it's determined, predetermined, but it does mean that there is the constraint put on object choice by the structure of the human body. The erogenous zone of the mouth is only so big. And it doesn't mean that a car can't become the object around which your oral drive circulates. It just means that it's less likely to become the object around which your drive circulates than a lollipop. Because lollipops fit mm. more than cars in your mouth. So maybe what we're working with here is like, um, like a, a spectrum of probability where like it would be like, okay, so the distance between feces and money is like this. The distance between breast and lollipop is like this. And car would be mm. way the fuck out here. So you could have this like spectrum of likely objects that a drive might have. So it's not purely indifferent to objects. You see, you can see why Lacan wants it to be. Lacan really wants to make this about the object is not a thing. It's an opening. You can put anything you want in there. At root though, it's this opening. And I get what he's saying. And that's important to note conceptually what he's doing. But practically speaking, and that's really how we're speaking about this is practically. I think you're right that there would be an order of magnitude or likelihood between the lollipop and the car relative to an oral drive. Doesn't mean car is impossible. It means it's less likely to emerge in analysis and life as an object for orality. Mm -hmm. How does that sit? Um, it sits really well. And yet, you know, I mean, when I think about anality, that is an area where we, where there is a greater range of, um, let's say metaphorizability or something like that. You know, uh, it just seems like always when we talk about this in the examples we give of objects of the oral drive, they are, they're not cars usually. They're, you know, they're usually the cigarette, the bit fingernail, um, 
you know, all that stuff. Whereas when we talk about anality, we're much more apt to talk about things like gift giving, um, stuff like that or money. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Which, yeah, which still seems to have, um, relative, like it seems to have departed from a sort of biological reading of erogenous zones, um, in a, in a much more significant way than, you know, typically cited oral objects. Brilliant. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it, okay. So if we add one more element, it could just be the final confusion that brings clarity to this matter. There could be in terms of like mouth relative to anus, some truth to the fact that the anus is almost always covered up. And I know mm. it's because right there's this movement where you you put you lay on your back and you throw your ass up in the air and you get a sunburn on your on your lower O ring, uh, this kind of like perennium tanning stuff. Which of course I live in San Francisco and it's a big city and all of a sudden it doesn't work. I don't have a yard that would allow me to expose my anus. Now, in my town, you can do a lot of anus exposing. In fact, the only rule is you have to have a newspaper with you so that if you get on the bus your bare anus can't touch the seat. You got to put the newspaper underneath your ass. Otherwise you're good to go. You can, I mean, so truth be told, I mean, I could be tanning my anus right now. Um, it's a little cloudy, but it, it could still work. But there's something about sociality here that might be important. The reason why maybe we have allow so many um, polymorphous substitutions for shit in a way that we don't with orality could be due to the fact that the mouth is always on display and the variations of things that we do with our mouth are fairly public. In fact, it's one of the original public acts, which is to speak. Shitting though, and the orifice that does that, the operative organ or site that does the shitting, that's a concealed thing. And what do we know about things that get repressed, concealed, socially or otherwise? They transmutate into all sorts of strange ways in a way that the rails of society might not allow otherwise. Um, so I was almost tempted to make a bad joke about creativity and art relative to shit, because this is also how Lacan sees painting. Painting, he says, is just like, all you're doing is looking at somebody who, who took some canvas and wiped their ass with it. He's quite literal about this. What we're doing when we observe a painting is we are enjoying watching somebody put their finger in shit and then wipe it on a page. It's a startling moment. I think it's in seminars 11 or 10. I forget which one, it was just, just before because we, we made a fuss of it, it was kind of wild. But the, I'll skip the bad joke about creativity um, but just to say that it may make sense that at the level of anality, we would have a much more variable field of substitute objects because the erogenous zone to which feces is connected is itself a socially repressed zone, maybe more so, I would argue more so mm. than the mouth by the sheer fact of display. Mm. I don't know. Thank you I'm for that. Right on, man. I'm, I'm just thinking aloud here. So by all means, holler about this, because um, I'm sure we're all going to have some thoughts about this in the coming days. Um, yeah. Uh, Cody, what's up? Hey, Sam. How's it going? It's good to see you. I'm good, good to be here. You. Yeah. Um, so it seems to me like we have we have series, lots of series, metonymic substitutions, like free associations, if we think back to uh, the dynamics of transference essay by Freud. Uh, you know, we're somehow engaged in seriality, and it seems like the drive um, almost is, is oddly involved in seriality in the sense that it leads us back to this primordial lack. Um, I'm curious if you can say more about that. Is it leading us to a more intractable contradiction, which would be libido? Um, yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> yes. And I like this question because it is um, a waypoint for us coming up and we are going to answer it. Right now we're just carving out the pieces and the seriality part is, is interesting. And I'm, I always hesitate around seriality with Lacan because 
he's not a chronological thinker. His thought, his thought does not work chronologically, which is why he always chafes at developmental talk, at stage talk. Like it's not like the oral stage, however plastic it may be, conditions the anal stage, conditions the phallic, conditions the stopic. It's not like that. He doesn't accept that shit. He is more of a wormhole thinker. He sees things as connecting across lines. So the scopic drive has more to do with the anal drive than it does with the phallic, I would argue. Um, and you could say that the invocatory drive has more to do with the oral drive than it does with the scopic in terms of like flow and conceptuality. Lacan makes a similar argument in his seminar on anxiety that you can connect these, um, these, these drives in these ways. Um, but seriality is tough because I don't want to suggest that libido, breast, cigarette, and then you then have to march your way back. But it's tough not to talk that way. Even if I want us to think differently, think more retroactively. If there's seriality in Lacan, it's a retroactive seriality is what I would suggest. And what I mean by that is that it's not Lacan who figures this out. I mean, it's actually the Romans who make a big deal out of this. The site of wisdom and learning in antiquity, for the Greeks, it was youth. The beauty of youth could drive somebody to learn a lot. Plato, Socrates, Phaedrus, boys, Alcibiades, he's a good one. You want an example of the drive in action? Check out Alcibiades, man. Alcibiades in the symposium, showing up drunk at the party. Alcibiades, according to Lacan in the subversion essay, is not neurotic. Bruce Fink even suggests Alcibiades might just be beyond desire. His pure desire may in fact put him on the path of the drive. Alcibiades could be a figure of the drive, this beautiful, renowned soldier, blah, blah, blah. The Romans though, they put wisdom in old folk because it was at the end of the day, at the end of the life, that you can look back and tell a coherent story about what happened that day or in your life. It's in hindsight that our vision is 2020. The owl of Minerva for Hegel always takes flight at dusk. Owls are symbols of wisdom, not because they can turn their heads around and all this kind of shit, not because they're always trying to figure out how many licks it takes to get to the center of a lollipop. Owls are symbols of wisdom because they take flight at night after the doings of the day are done. It's in looking back retrospectively that we're able to make sense. Kierkegaard understood this too. Life has to be lived forward, but it can only be understood backward. It's the basic dilemma of existentialism, second only to the fact that no one can take a bath for you, is the truth that life has to be lived forward but can only be understood backward. Isn't this the very original graph that gives us the graph of desire for Lacan? The same thing happens here. So what I would suggest is that logics of seriality are retroactive. It's at the end of the sentence, at the end of the book, at the end of the movie, when it turns out that he's been dead the whole time. That's the reason he couldn't, they couldn't see him. He was dead. It's in hindsight that we can string all of these events together into a narrative. Now, why am I bringing this up right now? It's not just to respond to Cody's smart question here. It's to suggest that this is also fundamental to psychoanalytic theory and technique. Retroaction was big for Freud and Lacan had an even bigger version of it. Part of what Lacan is doing in the 50s when he's trying to lay out the program of psychoanalysis that we inherit from Freud is a theory of retroactivity where in speech that is present, we're able to reach back and come to terms with events in our past such that they no longer are controlling our everyday life, but instead are resubjectivized as our history. The past is transformed into our history by present speech. That is a retroactive enterprise that assigns a certain element of seriality. I was this in order to become what I am now. 
And we haven't even gotten into Lacan's future anterior tense, the will have been part of analysis. Just at the simple relationship between past and present, seriality is not, in other words, some chronological thing. One to two to three to four and five, here I am in analysis. The one is analysis marching its way back through speech into re-territorializations of the past such that they become your history. This is why I think self-compassion is so important to what happens in analytic experience and why regret really doesn't have much place in what Lacan is talking about here. Why would I regret what happened to me or what I did except if I don't like the person that I've become. A compassionate relationship to self in the midst of and at the end of analysis is one without regrets. I was this in order to become who I am now and I rather like this motherfucker. But that element of seriality, I just wanna emphasize again, has a logical sense of time, not a chronological sense of time. And the word I used earlier was chirotic sense of time from the Greek kairos. It's about wormholes connecting things. And I want that logic to intersect with what we're doing with the drive. There is a retroactive element to the drive that we have not discussed yet. That's why, Cody, I'm saying this is a waypoint that we're going to get to. But I want that element of seriality to the extent that we even admit it to always be tinged with hindsight, with retrospection. Because I think that jibes with analysis and I think that it makes a lot of sense for what we're doing with the drive, but we're not there yet. Um, listen, we could go on listing drives. We could do the scopic, we could do the invocatory, and that's not all. Here are some that Lacan also throws out but does not theorize. The penile groove is an erogenous zone, as you know, but it is also the source of a drive. The vagina, erogenous zone, also the source of a drive. The belly button, respiratory erogeneity, the vascular fact of humanity, we breathe, also an erogenous zone. You want some more partial objects beyond breast, shit, gaze, and voice? Here are some, again, straight from Lacan, urinary flow, Phoneme, Mamilla, the nothing. You heard me say earlier that what enables this shift from objects little a to specular images, imaginary fixations from breast to cigarette, to stick with an example, is prohibition. Life in many ways, earlier more so, is a rolling series of normative developmental prohibitions, which result in losses, which generate experiences of lacks, which invite plugs, plugs from the world that we might just drop in. What happens in this process known as growing up is basically our lives become a proliferation of no things. Things that used to be okay that are now placed behind an X. The origin of the thing, which is nothing, is the production of no things, extending from the no of the father all the way through the rest. And our point here is prior to that even, if you wanted to assign a stage to this, the name of the father is properly in the phallic stage. But if you're running stages, anality would be before that, would be before that, orality before that. I'm not comfortable with the stage talk, but if you're gonna run it, libido even before that, sexuation occurring before that, what about the loss of the placenta? There are all these prohibitions and losses that are occurring before the paternal figure shows up and says no inaugurating the castrative process of alienation whereby a subject becomes in the symbolic. 
birth, the placenta, sexuation, the libido, weaning, the breast, potty training, feces, language acquisition. What exactly is prohibited by the name of the father? What's prohibited is any continuation of life without prohibition. But you could also say the cry. You don't get to cry anymore. Now you have to use your big boy words. In other words, if there were a phallic drive, and I'm not sure there is, its partial object might be your cry. Not my cry, your cry. Beyond that though, of course, would be libido, same as the rest. What I'm trying to get at here is a process whereby the needs of the infant or the child are increasingly subjected to and thus barred by and within the field of the other, the big other. That's what's happening here. The production of the drive has to do with the barring of the subject of pure need, the infant. Need, my needs are constantly being barred, constrained and subordinated to your demands. That's where this process starts. The result is my being as a living subject is just pocked with holes, missing parts, openings that I'm looking for something to fill. All of these are structured atop the other's demand. Think about this, morality. The baby demands something from the big other, but the, the, the meeting of this demand is subject to the interpretations of the big other. That's what the lower part of the graph of desire shows, especially in its early formative stages. Demand is need that is expressed in language. But the translation of a child or a baby's cry into a let's feed the baby is something that is happening strictly at the level of big A of the big other. That's why if you look in the lower left-hand circle of the graph of desire, you see signified according to the big other. That's the interpretive work that the parent or primary caregiver does of translating an indecipherable cry into a request or a demand for a blanket. My point here is that, yeah, the kid is the one doing the demanding there, but the activity and the effect of that demand is determined exclusively by the big other. Anality, it's more extreme. Now it's the big other demanding something of the child. So in other words, still calling the shots. We could go on and talk about the phallic moment in the Lacanian sense of the Oedipal phase, his reading of that with the paternal function. Desire gets started here. But what we know about desire is that it's always someone else's. My desire for you causes me to fantasize about other things that you might want instead of me so that I can identify with them in order to get my desire for you met. And at the end of the day, I just find myself desiring as you. My desire for you provokes my imagination of your desire, which in turn trains me to desire just like you. Now, this isn't that series of talks. I can point you in that direction if you want, but my point is the same. Morality, anality, phallic stage, if you will. What we see there is the infant as a subject of need being barred and subordinated to the demands of the big other. Here's the deal. The problem with this is that the object cause of my desire, lack, little a, gets confused with the object evoked and prohibited by the other's demand. And I'll say it again, because it's important here. The object cause of my desire, which is the experience of lack, gets confused with what it is I imagine you're demanding of me. It's in the drive beyond the fundamental fantasy, the traversing of the fantasy, 
that we see that confusion sorted out. Where I'm able to experience my lack as my lack, apart from what I imagine you to demand and desire. Again, we'll come to that. You hear talk in these circles about the fundamental fantasy. This is the fundamental fantasy. The fundamental fantasy is that we wind up envisioning the big other and all of its stand-ins from cops to daddies as whole, complete, full, omniscient, and thus always able to issue demands, always able to tell us what's needed at any given time, always able, if you want to be a little playful, to tell us what we want to hear. And I want you to hear it both ways. In some sense, what we're saying is, tell me what I'm supposed to want. At the end of seminar 11, this is also what Lacan says he hears when the analyzan first walks in, fix me. I know, you know what's up with me. You're the doctor, fix me. I demand that you fix me. The basic fantasy, the math theme of fantasy, split subject lozenge little a, is structured around our assumption that the other can issue demands because they know what they want. And that is a defense against the harsher truth, which is that they don't know what they want. They're as fucked up as we are. And instead of demanding what they are is in fact desirous. I live my life according to what I imagine you're demanding of me because that feels more comfortable than dealing with the fact that you, like me, don't know what I'm supposed to do. That's scary as hell. There are other reasons why this is a barrier, not least of which we'll come to when we talk about Lacan's essay on the drive next time on anxiety. But what we get at the level of fundamental fantasy is effectively two options. And if you look at the graph of desire, this becomes pretty clear. Desire passes into fantasy. You can see it in the graph of desire and you can go right or left. If you go left, you return down to the signified according to the big other. Big other as full, as the treasure trove, the one with all the answers. This is a fantasy that is fundamentally about the other as omniscient, as capable of issuing demands. What we know though, is that if you just keep telling the big other to tell you what to do, eventually what they're gonna say is show me you're castrated. Show me you've been circumcised. The bottom barrel of demand in this regressive cycle where instead of acknowledging the fact that nobody else knows better than you is anxiety what you try to avoid by returning to the idea of an other who is whole, in other words, not lacking, um, comes back to you in the end anyway, because the final demand is always show me that you're castrated. This was one of the central topics in our reading of seminar 10. Um, it's, you can follow that link in our link tree and you can, you can get those lectures if you want them. The other option though at fantasy is to turn right if you're looking at the graph of desire up to signifiers of the lack in the other. You risk anxiety, but you also find yourself with an opportunity structure to pursue something else, something beyond fantasy. And the right turn out of there is precisely what leads you to the drive. When the demanding other prevails, and even when the desirous other prevails, the subject of the drive is always subordinate, suppressed. Bruce Fink is great on this point at the end of his clinical introduction to Lacanian psychoanalysis. The process of demand to desire here shows that a demanding other suppresses 
the subject of the drive as much as, but in different ways, as a desirous other. The goal is to flip that, metaphorically speaking, so that the object cause of my desire can also be part and parcel of what I do as a subject of the drive. This is gonna be one of the next week as well. If there is a key question regarding the object of the drive, which is ostensibly what we've been talking about here, this object that is in fact an opening, it's how do you get from an experience of the object as someone else's demand to an experience of the object as my lack? To reclaim from this fantasy of life pegged on what we imagine the other to be demanding, something more akin to a lack that is uniquely mine. This is that desublimation that I was talking about here, a shift from these imaginary objects, cigarettes, lollipops, cars, money, and the like, back to, if we can use that chronological term, back to something that can be experienced as my lack, which is not a thing in the world, but instead an opening into which I've been shoving things all these years. This is how we read the mathem of the drive. And this will be my final point today. The mathem of the drive looks a hell of a lot like that of fantasy. There is a split subject, lozenge, living their life in relation to little a in the case of fantasy, which is what I imagine other people to want, and big D, demand, societal demands in the case of the drive. It's no coincidence that the mathem of fantasy looks a lot like the mathem of the drive because they're constantly supplanting each other. And in the best case scenario, the traversing of the mathem of fantasy would leave you with that of the drive. Now, lots has been said about the mathem of fantasy, not as much about the mathem of the drive. Let me tell you where I think we are with this. Once the subject and the other have faded out, what's left in the mathem of the drive is an opening rim-like structure that is crucially just the lozenge. And I want you to know that this has been in plain sight in Lacan's work from the start. Bruce's translation of a Cree, page 692. You don't need to have the book in front of you. I'll read it. The drive is what becomes of demand when the subject vanishes from it. Don't forget that barred subject in the mathem of the drive is a vanishing subject, aphanesis. It goes without saying that demand also disappears, except that the cut remains. Big D goes away, just as split subject goes away. What's left is the cut, here represented by the lozenge. For the latter remains present in what distinguishes the drive from the organic function it inhabits, namely its grammatical artifice, so manifest in the reversals of its articulation with respect to both source and object. The mathem of the drive allows the demands of others and the split subject to fade away so that what's left when the drive is operational is the cut, the opening, the diamond itself, the lozenge itself. And notice how Lacan moves from here to an almost reciprocal structural relation between the object of the drive and its source. I said this before, I'll say it again. The object of the drive and its source are openings with rim-like structures. Little a marks an opening, not truly an object. It's a portal, the same way your mouth is a portal. There is a secret, and I would say should be obvious affinity 
between the object of the drive and its source. The object of the drive is not the cigarette. It's the operationalization of the mouth. That's again why Lacan has the example of going to a restaurant and ordering food. The drive is at work when you order the food as well as when you consume what arrives 20 minutes later. It is the in-out operation of an erogenous zone that shows the drive at work. And I would just say that it's so relevant to our purposes that it's very tempting to even suggest that what we have here in this diagram of the drive are two lozenges atop each other, interfacing, one of which points to the opening that is objea, the other of which points to the opening that is the erogenous zone, object of the drive and source of the drive. These are not just openings. I want to emphasize this. They are functional rims, operationalizable. With the exception of the outer ear, these are erogenous zones that open and close, almost in a pulse-like function almost like the unconscious. These openings with rim-like structures pervade objects and sources of the drive. And it's here that we get our first clue to drive satisfaction. Now, this may sound like a wild ride, but we are orienting ourselves towards that beyond of analysis and that experience of drive satisfaction. It's gonna be our centerpiece next week, but even here, as we're talking about the object qua opening and the source qua opening, we get a taste, a hint, a clue as to what drive satisfaction is about. Drive satisfaction, what feels good when the drive is at work, and this may be the test as to whether you are operationalizing yours, is not when you secure or access an object, something, a cigarette, lollipop, whatever, real, symbolic, imaginary, or otherwise. It is instead this circling around of something, this circuitous movement where the aim comes out, circles around, and then returns back to the source. It emerges from one opening, and flits around another. Crucial. The drive emerges from one of many mouths on the human body, flits around another opening in human experience in order to then return back to that mouth. It's, I think, the foundational insight into how the drive works. Two openings. In this sense, the object of the drive is also that of psychoanalysis itself. Remember, psychoanalysis is a science, but it's not concerned with objects. Objectivity is not the logic of psychoanalysis. Objectality is. It's not concerned with objects, but with openings, causes. Here again, we see this resonance between the openings of the source and the object of the drive and the very objective of psychoanalytic thought itself. Think about it this way. These operative openings that center psychoanalysis, but also that animate the drives, each of the four basic drives has an opening in it. The operation of the mouth at the level of ordering food and then consuming, there's an out of ordering and an in of consuming. Anality, you can withhold shit or squeeze it out. There's an out and an in, and the source is what manages what comes in and what goes out. This in out process, opening, closing, is what the drive looks like when it's operating. It's an opening 
closing, opening, closing, in, out, in, out. The scopic drive. Now you might say the object of the scopic drive is the gaze. I don't think so. The object of the scopic drive is in fact the gap between the eye that sees and the gaze that might look back. It's the gap between my eye and the computer in front of me. The opening, if you will, between the eye and the gaze is in fact the object of the scopic drive, not the gaze. The invocatory drive, same logic. It's the distance between the voice that cries and the ear that hears. And think about the intimacy of speaking and hearing. What you're hearing right now, and all the more so if we were here in person, is coming from inside my body. This voice is starting right about here. It comes from inside me and goes out. And where does it go? Even in this mediated format, what you're hearing right now is entering your outer ear and into you. Speech is like sex in that it is extremely intimate because insides interact. My voice leaves the interior of my body in order to enter yours and vice versa. My point here is that each of the drives has this as an opening between two in-out structures. Can I do a clarification question? Yep. So um, I guess like when people like Zizek talk about, um, um, you know, with gays and whatnot and whatnot, I, I, and just what you're saying, I just want to clarify a little bit. So like in um, Psycho, when the house like, is looking back and, and the anxiety that might cause or like, uh, I guess what is the one with the can uh, on the water? So um, uh, I, I just, I wasn't quite understanding like the distance thing that you're talking about. Could you explain that a little bit for, in contrast to um, this, uh, some of the analysis, you know, like again with the psycho, and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So in seminar 11, this is what I'm referring to, um, you know, Hitchcock aside, um, in seminar 11, there is that passage with the tuna can kind of bobbing around. Um, Lacan makes as much to do about the gaze that the can embodies. And a gaze, by the way, is, doesn't mean that something's looking back at you. The gaze are, is all of the positions in your umwelt, in the world around you, in your environment, from which you could be seen. So the panoptic tradition from Bentham to Foucault just realized the truth of all this, that you can put a prison tower in the middle of the prison okay. yard with mirrored windows and whether there's anybody up there or not, the logic of the gaze is enough to discipline the prisoners because it's the potential to be watched that disciplines us more than the actual fact of a prison guard staring at you. We oh, okay, so it's the, the yeah. so it's this panoptic kind of idea is what they're getting at with the like Lacan's getting at with with the uh, with it. The gaze is closely related to what Bentham to Foucault is doing with Panopticon. I bring it up as another point of reference because some folks are more steeped in that tradition. Right. And read this section of seminar 11. But if you read 11 carefully, Lacan has a lot to say about the gaze that that tuna can has as it's bobbing around in the ocean. But he also has a lot to say about the eye, the eye that sees versus the gaze from which you could be seen, but might not be. And could you say it, a little more about that? Uh, that's what, um, uh, can you flesh out a little more the, the eye that's seen? As a, yeah. Just hang on a second, just hang on a yeah. second. This is a good question that you've asked, and I imagine it's one that other people have too. Lacan in these sections is also gonna talk about the gap between the eye and the gaze. And what I'm suggesting is that in our theorization of the scopic drive, a more productive move than reading the partial object as the gaze is to instead read it as the gap between my eye and the laptop that may be staring back at me or the, the plant up on the shelf or the tuna can out there. What I'm trying to suggest is that the object of the drive is always gonna be an opening. And just identifying it with the gaze as a capacity to be watched is insufficient. It doesn't comport with the theory. 
the consistency of drive theory in Lacan is going to position the partial object, the little a that animates the scopic drive, not in the gaze and not in the eye, but in the differential relationship between them. And I do believe that that is supported in seminar 11. Okay. okay. Now, please follow up because you've got a really good fish on the line here, so to speak. Um, I don't know if you muted yourself. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Did, did you? I, I did want to take time. Did you say you want to discuss this a little more, or I didn't quite understand what you what you were saying? Yeah, I was saying go ahead and follow up because I asked you to pause for a second while I finished answering the first part. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So I mean, it's obvious when you're talking about like the the mouth, right? Because like things going in and things going out and and whatnot, and and the um, uh, breathing and eating and the mother's nipple and and things like that. Um, I guess the the eye as a parallel uh, with the in and out, I'm missing part of the subtlety of your argument. About the in and out? Um, I, right, you were, you, were, you were take, talking about, I know you're saying so many interesting things, I'm just trying to get a sense of it. So like kind of the, um, you used, well, okay, earlier we started with the thrust. I was looking at your diagram and, and then you talked about like, um, you're interested in archery and like kind of the arrow that you shoot up in the air and comes down. And so it's like, you know, it's, I'm still processing a lot of things you were saying, but I guess I'm just trying to think of how the equivalency. And then I was just thinking back to, I remember, you know, one of your classes and I was just wondering like when people talk about like in the common public, let's say some people are educated, they might say, oh, going back to Freud, one can sort of see this, but it's like an overly stated thing but I remember you were talking about like with like say like people with eating disorders that it's very serious this issue say with the mouth and that so that the like a Lacanian psychoanalyst could really help uh, ex kind of going in dialogue with the person as opposed to saying oh there's something to it but it's sort of like a big overgeneralization and that like kind of it's like uh, so so we need to take this stuff very seriously because I remember you were saying that um you know obviously we have a challenge with eating disorders or in a culture um so so that it's important to really hone in on these things and, and point it out to to clients but then i guess the, the other thing i was just saying like the um uh oh, okay i guess like I'm, I'm trying to remember someone like the i know he has the thing with the eye but you're saying i i see it so much with the mouth but the eye seems a little more um uh like we don't like I mean, obviously we open our eyes to look at things and close our eyelids, but we don't physically like poke like something into our eyes and then take it out. So it's just it trying to, okay. with, the, with the literalness of that. Yep, that's important. The experience of the sense of vision is very different from that of hearing. Um, part of the reason why objectifications usually proceed through sight and rather than sound is because there is a kind of distance already built in to sight. What I see on the inside of me, so to speak, is not what is actually before me. So when I look at the plant across the desk from me, that plant does not enter my body, right? There's a representation of the plant that then right. pops up for me. Um, and it's different with hearing. When I speak and you listen, or when you speak and I listen and we're together, we are interpenetrating each other. Your voice actually enters my body when you're talking and vice versa. Not the same when you look at me and I look back at you. So there is a different logic of interiority at the level of hearing and seeing. Interesting, so this goes back to like early philosophical work about like the primary, what they call it, primary things um, versus like like um, a color or something like that. That's like a secondary phenomenon. I forget how you call that a philosophy. It could, uh, it could, it could yeah. if you want, if you wanted to. If you wanted to make that move from Plato forward, you can, you can work it that way. But I want to suggest though that because an eyelid can be closed or opened, it right. establishes an interior and an exterior. And might this also be what's different between the eye and the ear again? Is that the ear can't be closed? in a way that the eye can. So the intimacy that hearing allows is at some level unstoppable. And yet the distantiality that vision allows can be easily stopped by simply closing your eyes. And I wanna just leave it at that 
because sure. we've got about three minutes left and I want to be respectful of folks' time here. Um, but I don't want to end with much more than that, except a final image. I would like to suggest that the drive of drives, the primary drive, and I'm just throwing this out there, it's just a thought. It could be completely incorrect. I would like to suggest that there is some truth to what Lacan says in the subversion of the subject essay about respiratory erogeneity. That breathing, breathing may be the site of a drive, perhaps called the respiratory drive, that may be not just one drive, another in the list, but perhaps the basic model of the drive itself is that of breathing. And so I thought the other day about an image of this that might work. And I'm walking along and this little eight-year-old, my little eight-year-old likes chewing gum and she blew a bubble, popped it and drew the gum back in, chewed it again and blew a bubble again. Now look at the diagram in front of you. Turn your laptop on the side. Rotate this thing so that it's sideways, on its side. There's the mouth with a bubble being blown out. The final image for today is that of a bubble blown while chewing gum. And the whole process of that, where you inspire, you blow into using your tongue and your mouth and your teeth to shape this thing, that you press out into only in order to have it pop and be sucked back in. Breathing is not so different from this, but with the bubble, you actually get to see an image of this. And if there would be an imaginary object for this bubble, it may very well be the caption box beneath your Instagram post. It may very well be that little bubble or that cloud that comes out of the character's mouth into which the signifier is put. Now you see why I would want to have perhaps a theory of respiratory erogeneity and a respiratory drive that may be primal. Not just because my kid likes to chew gum, but because I think there's something to do here with the relationship between the signifier, sexuality, death, where we started, that may just provide us, however slight, with an opening into which we might be able to access this pure, undivided life, where it all begins, according to Lacan. What we have now are the basic structures of the drive. We have the basic types of the drive in front of us. And we have, for lack of a better term, a kind of seriality here. We're trying to get somewhere with the drive. We know it's important. We're learning how it works. Next time, what I want to focus on is how it plays out in analysis and what might even be past the drive. I don't just want to figure out finally what drive satisfaction is relative to enjoyment. I want to touch on this other term, which is truly where Lacan ends seminar 11. It's on love. The notion of limitless love that would be activated by the desire of the analyst. The analyst's desire for what Lacan in the final page of seminar 11 calls absolute difference. I think there's something there. But in keeping with how we do things here, after lots of heavy lifting, it's fun to speculate. And that's really where I'm at. Respiratory drive, maybe. Love beyond the drive, maybe. To be a Lacanian is to always be living like this. And I think it's important that we end there. I'll stick around for additional questions if you've got them. Um, but otherwise, I'm gonna hit pause on the recording so that we can uh, have a little more, um, a little more free play and you won't feel so pressured if you do feel pressured.